Um, as, as Philip mentioned, I'm the research team lead in Earth System Science, and it is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce our next speaker, Niels Vedi, um, who has wide-ranging interests in numerical weather prediction and various aspects of the interactions among Earth system components. Um, he did his PhD, earned his PhD uh, from LMU in Munich in 2004. He has a long-running uh, affiliation with the European Center for Medium-Range Weather Forecasts, where he has been the head of Earth System Modeling since 2016. He will soon be transitioning to a new position as the Digital Technology Lead for the Destination Earth Program at ECMWF. Uh, which brings up the topic of the talk today. Um, he'll be introducing and giving an overview of the very forward-looking, very ambitious, and very exciting Destination Earth project. So, Niels, thank you for joining us uh, at, at our annual workshop and very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, let me just share the share my presentation. Right. Is that okay? Yes, fine. Okay, great. So thank you very much uh, for this invitation to this workshop. Um, and I hope that this overview will, will fit in nicely into the uh, general discussions that have happened over the course of the week with respect to the introduction of the different digital twins. And, um, and I would like to introduce you uh, to another one, which um, we call Destination Earth, or this is the name of the program uh, initiated by the European Commission um, as part of the Green Deal, where uh, we are attempting to build a replica of the Earth system and its interaction um, with human activity. So um, make no mistake, in a way, you might get the wrong impression, but this talk is in a way also um, a, a fusion of physics-based models and uh, deep learning. So uh, not too far away, perhaps, from some of the ambitions of the previous speaker. And um, let me start with a quote, um, in fact, from uh, the CEO of Black Shark AI, um, who works uh, for Microsoft Flight Simulator. And he said, a near real-time digital twin of our planet, which opens up a trillion use cases where traditional photogrammetry like Google Earth or what Apple Maps is doing is not helping because those are just simplified for photos and clued on simple geometric structures. And I think it's very fitting. It's also a fitting introduction here because, um, you know, you notice Microsoft Flight Simulator, you notice games and very much, I think our science and, and our progress here with Spreaker Digital Twins has been um, implicated by the gaming industry. And, um, and I think they already have very much, I think, the idea that we can build a virtual world. We heard the news about metaverses, omniverse, and in fact, uh, in the introduction to this workshop, um, I think um, there, was, uh, there was the um, thing shown from, um, from NVIDIA. And in fact, I have the same slide, if you like, because NVIDIA, NVIDIA announced to build Earth 2. They have this dream of using basically the power of AI technology, the power of their um, supercomputing infrastructure, the GPUs, um, which were also inspired and made initially for the gaming industry. So are we just uh, planning another big game? No, I, I hope not. Um, in fact, we want to use it for, for various serious uh, applications, um, but it is not too far, if you like, from this vision of being able to interact and share online, not our gaming experiences, but in fact, interact and share with each other the combined but cross-disciplinary knowledge that we have of, for the different disciplines that we are working on. And I'm, of course, coming from the weather and climate um, community and have specific expertise in this area and can contribute my data and my visions um, through this new digital twin, but other people can equally contribute their vision and their expertise in, in ways that we would like to 
automate in ways that we would like to make more accessible and more understandable so that we can basically feed on each other's expertise and vision in the context, of course, of complex systems. So here is NVIDIA's vision of, of um, Earth 2, and, uh, and it is a combination of uh, um, physics-based modeling, of course, but also their rendering environment and the combination of, uh, of course, AI technology in order to make this information accessibly accessible and, and fast accessible. So as has been uh, discussed during the course of this workshop, of course, as well, is um, that we are not alone uh, in the weather and climate community to attempt something like this. Um, there are other disciplines like self-aware aerospace vehicles, patient-specific medicine, and, um, and other elements that attempt a similar thing where you, you see the outside frame, but you can look deeper if you have a digital twin. You can, you can basically understand structures below the surface, below the pictures that you, in our case, can see from space. And, um, and I think this is one of the, one of course, of the typical and classical examples of data fusion where um, we, we can exploit basically combined information because we have information over subsurface structures, but we have information also from satellite that sees the surface, can even sometimes see below the surface given uh, different uh, radio frequencies. But, um, and it's no, no mistake, or if you like, no, no, not by chance that Antarctica in this case is plotted in a not too dissimilar way to blood flows um, in, the, in the heart picture on the right. So digital twins are really much more than just a data mapping exercise. It is really more about deeper understanding of the different sources of information that we have available in order to be able to derive a um, complex um, decision that ultimately, in our case, leads to adaptation decisions, mitigation decisions, and, um, and of course, their financial implications. So we're building on past investments and indeed um, try and scale these to the extreme. As you also know, and this was also, I think, mentioned in one of the earlier talks this week, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2021 was awarded particularly for the understanding of complex systems and, um, and also with the, with the link to Earth system and Earth climate and quantifying variability, uncertainty, and reliably predicting really global warming. So this is what we want to build on. And, and really build this up to an extent that we have a tool available that allows us to exchange information, to interact and to ask questions. So I mentioned this has financial implications. So climate policy reality really is a huge financial implication. As you can see on the graph here on the top right, um, there are trillion US dollars required in order to um, work on this adaptation, keep this 1.5 degree pathway viable. And, um, and as a result of this, as we also saw in some of these talks, for example, energy grid planning, when say 80% of the energy comes from renewable energy and is volatile and is dependent on weather and climate, um, then um, you know, it becomes clear that this also becomes a, a usable tool perhaps for active planning of, of, these, um, of these elements. And clearly, um, the investment that now the European Union makes in respect of developing such system is dwarfed in comparison to the numbers that are quoted here um, that, that will have to be spent basically in order to make uh, you know, the, the Earth system a, a viable continued enterprise. So how can we contribute in this context? Um, well, we have already simulated um, the, the physical system, if you like, at various resolutions. The nine kilometers that you see in the middle here, this is like the grid size um, between globally uh, uniformly distributed grid points across the globe in this case. And on the left-hand side, a similar simulation, but with a grid size globally of just one or 1 1.4 kilometer on average here. And, um, and in, for us, this means quite a difference in terms of how we can represent basically the different um, elements that we want to simulate. So most notably, for example, convection, which uh, is resolved, uh, at least the deep convection part is resolved in the left-hand picture, whereas it has to be parameterized with some more, say, unknown um, 
assumptions in the pictures on the right. And clearly, as you can see in the very right picture here, if you were to just ignore this and switch it off, but at the wrong grid size, for example, you would get like um, the wrong answer. But we start to see convergence basically of these processes that are really important because the tropics, for example, drive basically also elements of the global circulation that are relevant for redistribution of, of pollutants. And, and this is uh, an important aspect that we can start to resolve when we go to this resolution at about one kilometer. Now, of course, it would be better to go even higher. And of course, it's true that uh, we won't be able to resolve everything in the Earth system. There will, remaining, there will be remaining uncertainties. But um, we can move, I think, quite a long way towards um, a more, say, reliable and trusted system with respect to these big uncertainties that we still have in climate and weather simulation arising from the representation of clouds and convection. This particular simulation required, of course, very large computing resources. So this was run on Summit, the, um, at the time, biggest computer in the world. And um, the enterprise here with respect to destination Earth will also build on uh, an active uh, use of the now built up EuroHPC uh, computing platforms that are going to be installed across Europe in different countries. Um, another big cost factor in this enterprise is of course also uncertainty quantification and how we can um, reliably basically give information not only about this is going to happen, but also we are pretty sure this is going to happen because we have like basically bounds on uncertainty. So the classical way we do this in numerical weather prediction is that we send an ensemble with perturbed initial conditions and also um, perturb the trajectory as we move forward in time with mechanisms like perturbing part of the physical parameterization that we're uncertain about and that are still in the system and run these 51, in this case, different realizations. So this is kind of the state of the art, if you like, of uh, ensemble prediction that will become operational sometime next year at ECMWF, where we run basically 51 of those members at an average resolution of nine kilometer. And, um, and here, this was just a, a sort of realization where, which happened, I think, in 2020, where uh, for the first time we saw five hurricanes basically on a single satellite picture snapshot um, building in the in the Atlantic and of course threatening um, the US but also of course smaller islands in their in their pathway. So the movie you see here is not the movie in time it's an overlaying of those 50 ensemble members as they um, you know um, build their um, perturbed trajectories. So it's just one way of um, addressing uncertainty. Another one um, that is really another aspect that's really important that comes back to this idea of fusing data, which is very common to us in numerical weather prediction, is um, the aspect of data simulation. So in this case, um, you see here um, the latest preparations for a new mission from ESA called EarthCare where um, they can measure basically vertical profiles of um, you know, the, the air and the distribution of, of like aerosols and, and distribution of, of moisture in this case, where you can actually start to see structure in the clouds. And you can use this information to better um, constrain, in fact, this uncertainty that I mentioned before about clouds and convection, and therefore um, make a better initial condition and therefore also better prediction forward in time. So here you see like uh, snapshots of these cloud sat radar reflectivity. Of course, this satellite is not flying yet. So this is just a preparatory mission for this satellite. So before this satellite flies, we do a lot of work basically in order to simulate what it would be like when it is up there. So um, in this case, uh, we, we use then cloud sat data radar reflectivity in the top picture and compared it with simulations at one kilometer, four kilometer, nine kilometer grid sizes and see basically how the model would represent basically these different vertical profiles in time of the clouds. And then uh, we go back to the simulation space and trying to improve basically the realization of those clouds in the model. Yeah, another important point is that we do comparison in observation space. So basically we use the model data because this is the most accurate way how we do data simulation. Basically we, we, we um, work in the space of the observations and do the comparison in observation space in this case. 
to reduce any errors of uh, interpolation, if you like, of the non-equally distributed data that we typically get from satellite information and other sources of information. So this is in fact, another challenge also for digital twin type exercise and also machine learning type exercises that we have this data distributed in various different grids and in various different formats and, and elements like this. So there is this huge challenge of bringing it together but, um, but we should not make the mistake to try and just like, oh yeah, let's harmonize and, and, and interpolate it all to the same grid, because in a way this will lose you so much information that basically you lose the power and the information that, that is contained in these. So we solve this in this particular case by moving actually the model data to observation space. But there are other elements like capturing changing landscapes, for example, in this case, which is important for water resource and water resource management. Um, the land use and coastal area management, they're obviously at risk with increasing um, water levels and sea level rise. But also like more recently uh, in the news is the estimation of methane emissions and how they can contribute and how they do contribute to um, the warming um, levels that we see. And clearly this changing landscape, the changing monthly wet, wetland changes have huge implications on these budgets. And these budgets are important, again, also financially important because ultimately, um, you know, there are CO2 certificates, there will probably be methane certificates for this at some point where um, indeed we, we need to um, come to independent estimations beyond boundaries and beyond borders where we can estimate um, these uh, emissions and therefore come towards, say, a more global stewardship of our Earth system. And this is another ambition we will have um, by building Destination Earth. There's also this element of uh, bridging these gaps from global to local scales. So really, um, there are research projects at the moment, like the Paris Olympics, where they want to see implications uh, for towns. You know, there are also projects where, you know, what does the, what would the Paris Olympics look like in, in 2050 or something um, in order to bring in elements of, of change? And you can ask those questions, hopefully in the future, with, um, you know, advances towards these digital twins. Um, but there are also, of course, active um, issues about, you know, landscape planning, about uh, elements of how you build cities in the future in order to uh, make them viable, as particular when, when things um, heat up. But we have a big gap at the moment with respect to the grid sizes and the element of information, the locality, if you like, or, or also actually the locality where you see change um, and you can easily see a change of ecological systems locally, but how you map them back to your information that we currently have in the global models. Um, this is not such an easy, easy bridge to take. And that's another uh, hope that we have that we can work um, to ease basically this, this transition. So then coming to the actual program and to the implementation and the implementing entities of this destinations program. I already mentioned it's based on uh, computing power provided by the Euro HPC joint undertaking, most notably um, installations. Um, the biggest installations will be in Kajani in, in Finland um, called Lumi. Um, there will be a, a Leonardo, uh, a big machine in Italy, in Bologna, and, uh, and Mara Nostrum, another big machine in Barcelona. So um, the three institutes, international institutions that work together in this enterprise is ECMWF, where I work, who's responsible for the implementation of the first two digital twins, one focusing on extreme weather and another one on climate change. Um, it will also involve you know, developing extreme scale software. I mentioned machine learning before, and of course, um, the HPC workflows and the implementation on the different um, Euro HPC machines. Then there's Oymetsat, who will be responsible for the data uh, transformation, but also for the data flow between, say, the usage side and the, and the production side, which will be ECMWF. Um, and I will be handling the data bridges that allow you to connect to this data and, and uh, um, will handle the overall infrastructure data flow. Um, so this is Oymetsat. And then we have ESA, who is, in fact, formally in charge of the entire enterprise. And they're responsible for the core service platform and the user portal. Also, of course, machine learning interfaces, access to the data facilitating 
um, the interaction really with the usage side and use cases and uh, also various impact sector um, interactions. But one important aspect I think that we also um, is, want to say is that basically as part of destination nurse, you know, in particular the impact sector side is something that's not coming as an afterthought. It is really something where we want to interact with, where we want to also build in their requirements and, and make sure that basically the system can work for the people, in fact, for people at different levels of expertise in the future. And that will be a big challenge. And all of this um, is funded by the European Commission. So coming then to these uh, different user levels that I already mentioned, um, you know, this of course involves an, uh, quite a bit of technical infrastructure as well. And as you can see on the picture on the right, these different user levels have different, have different um, use cases. They have different ways of, of uh, accessing data and even different requirements with respect to the data profile. So this could be, you know, um, very large, long time series data sets. This could also be, you know, for extreme events, maybe just sort of data cube access for particular channels of, of information that they want and they want it fast. Um, because the decision is, is like, you know, in real time, perhaps, so, or very close to the event. Um, so we will have to handle and manage somehow these different uh, user level expectations. Um, the platforms that people will accessing this through will be cloud based. So um, there will be also a distributed and federated data infrastructure probably across different sites, uh, as I mentioned, different UHP sites and different physical locations. And uh, naturally, uh, the data cannot be moved uh, physically um, in the raw data form um, from those different sites. So therefore, we have to find innovative ways how we can connect this data in these different physical locations. And in fact, also reduce the data using machine learning um, and other ways of data compression and intelligent data compression in order to bring this to the user in um, the minimum amount of time. As I mentioned before, we implement these two digital twins. One is the extremes, and the other one is um, focusing on climate adaptation uh, and helping basically climate adaptation policies and mitigation scenarios, and, uh, and also stressing again this element of um, interaction that we would like to facilitate in the future. This will not happen in phase one. Perhaps the whole project is uh, split in different phases. Um, we will um, provide basically after phase one, which is only two and a half years, a prototype of the system and a prototype of these implementations, and then hopefully we'll be able to refine and increase the user base in the subsequent phase. Um, okay, so yeah, I already mentioned basically the different access patterns and the different phasing um, for this thing. So. Um, Initially, indeed, um, I think, you know, it's fair to say that we, it will not be completely open to the public right from the beginning, but um, it will gradually open up a larger range of scientific and industrial users as the system becomes, um, you know, more into the operational phase and, and more in a, you know, stable um, running environment. So this, um, some of the challenges that we, we face, of course, is, um, these aspects of uh, running basically on these different computing platforms. So there are, um, of course, the numerical algorithms and different aspects of our models that we have to readily adapt to the available EuroHPC machines. We already know they will be based on hybrid computing architectures of CPU and GPU. And therefore, um, we need to make sure that our uh, digital twin models that are uh, underlying basically some of these, some, some of these technology um, will have to run very efficiently on these platforms. And, um, and um, then the next step, of course, is also a careful design of the actual data flows between the different sites, but also the data flows um, and data reduction and data lifecycle management um, as we um, anticipate that we cannot store basically all the data we are um, readily producing. So in terms of the different components and breakthroughs that we expect, um, one can sort of um, lit, basically structure this in terms of the methodologies at the bottom and the production side, the data lakes I mentioned and the analytics side of um, 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 the data. 
using these cloud computing platforms. You have also the high performance in cloud computing at the bottom. You have the big data handling that I mentioned before, and you have this fast and flexible user interface elements at the top of this, um, of this structure. So then uh, clearly um, one of the elements is the investment in this adaptation to this emerging and diverse HPC that I mentioned before. Um, and the other elements are really um, these cloud-based technology infrastructure elements and how we can in fact also flexibly deploy perhaps in the future uh, very high performance computing workflows onto the HPC. So what specifically I mean here is, um, you know, that uh, in the longer term, not in phase one, but in the in future phases, we anticipate that uh, one could launch on demand, you know, perhaps event driven um, um, new digital twins onto HPC platforms produced in a time critical fashion further information that will then be able to uh, we can be able to to bring back um, to the user in, and that typically time critical fashion means you know run times of one hour or two and this is very much then aligned with um, you know typical NWP experience today which also has only one hour to execute everything there is to execute uh, in terms of the forward model at least So the overall benefits from um, this development are uh, clearly multifaceted, as you can see here. Um, there are different HPC software engineering paradigms that, that are going to be employed. Um, it is clearly supporting geographic diversity because not only we are using uh, HPC resources across the distributed across countries, but actually it, this system will also provide access to uh, people located in, in quite a, a range of, of different localities and will have um, computing resources available for the specific task of um, you know, Earth system stewardship. And um, this comes, of course, with rendering and visualization services, something that, that clearly NVIDIA has also put forward in, in their vision. Um, and I mentioned data cubes access, so we basically uh, don't like copy all the data somewhere, but get just specific elements of this data. Um, we have developed an open source geoscientific modeling library that uh, allows you to um, you know, build new digital twins, um, maybe for your specific purposes. There are then other elements like this novel HPC deployment strategies I mentioned. Um, I mentioned, yeah, the distributed challenges of, of distributing and, and uh, accessing the data. And of course, uh, machine learning and AI tools that allow you to deal with this data. So not only data access and how to get it into these machine learning tools, but actually also uh, elements of uh, labeling, pre-training and uh, feature detection and things like this. And um, that's pretty much it from me. My ambition clearly is for Destination Earth to build a system that can more effectively support global Earth system stewardship and um, it's an ambitious goal, um, but we are excited to uh, be part of this um, initiative. And um, yeah, um, in two years time, we'll see where we are. Okay, thank you, Niels, for that very exciting talk. Um, I'd like to open it up now to the audience for any questions. Waiting to see if there are raised hands. Uh, it looks like Attila has one. Please go ahead. All right, thank you. Thanks, uh, Niels, for your really interesting talk. I'm uh, specifically interested in uh, to what extent um, do you plan or do you incorporate uh, machine learning in the modeling? What type, more specifically, could you elaborate a bit more on let's say which components you would accelerate with machine learning or what is data-driven versus physics and prompt in your, in your approach? Um, yeah, there are, there are different elements to this. Yeah, I didn't uh, you know, specify this in, in too much detail, this is true. 
Um, so one is, of course, building and improving the initial state. So basically, it's a part of the data simulation mechanism where we have a number of machine learning mechanisms that allow us to help in this process. So, for example, in the operation processing, error finding, you know, we already use machine learning basically to, um, to find basically where there are, say, you know, observations that don't fit. So we, we keep basically uh, what we call a bias correction, a history, a variational bias correction history of observations and, um, and are able to basically filter out mistakes, um, if you like. Um, so that's sort of on the error correction side. Um, then we use machine learning um, for um, accelerating actually part of the models itself. So in the time critical part, we are thinking of replacing basically elements of uh, remaining physical parameterization. For example, radiation could be one um, where we could uh, basically train them and then apply them in the critical pass basically when we run the actual digital twin. So this would be on the HPC. Then there is a, a machine learning involved in the parts basically that deal with the digital twin data also on the HPC in order to train uh, emulation surrogate models you to basic, for example, find the tropical cyclones in the data set, things like this. So that's what happens still on the raw data. We also anticipate to use machine learning, that's what I meant with intelligent data compression, um, to find, for example, from the data thresholds, you know, because some applications only need really to know um, how often basically things kind of go beyond a certain threshold and things like this. So that machine learning can be readily involved in basically scanning your data and, and, and providing this information. Um, also is then an effective mechanism of reducing the data because we, um, we could then, once we move things to like the, the core service platform, um, we would have basically different data sets, for example, for machine learning, you know, for other machine learning applications, often they, they, they need just benchmark data sets. So basically they, um, you know, we provide just certain uh, parameters, you know, NVIDIA at the moment only trains on, you know, very few uh, atmospheric parameters, in fact, to tune their machine learning, their, their deep learning models. So therefore we would uh, anticipate to provide some of these data sets and keep updating them as we, um, as we go. Um, and make those available more readily, you know, closer to basically where these models are run. So not on the HPC perhaps anymore, but, but basically, for example, on the data lake or on the core service platform. So this would be for benchmarking data sets like weather bench or things like this. There are already papers about that. And, um, and obviously, you know, finally in the processing part, like precipitation and, and you know, and things like this, um, you can actually more accurately map, use machine learning to, to map basically things closer to the location where you are and, and, um, and basically use it in the, you know, in the final post-processing step. There is a vision, if you like, also to use machine learning as a continuous training task. So as we are running the digital twin models, we, we, you know, there would be a machine learning training exercise, if you like, running all the time in order to continuously improve a, um, you know, emulator model. But as of today, I have not seen any of those working, at least in our domain. So be interesting if this is actually possible. This would suit us well because we wouldn't have to keep the data all the time. We could just keep the data for some sort of window. But, um, but uh, and that would solve like a lot of data problems, but whether this is actually enough and you could produce and like learn a machine learning model as you go along and eventually it will be really good um, is an open question, um, but it would fit our, our way of producing if you like. Right, That's what I call online training. I don't know whether it's, uh, you know, that makes sense, but yeah. Okay, um, it looks like Leonard Schuler has a question. Leonard, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, so the, the outlook to, to deploy um, a digital twin uh, in case of some, some event happens sounds, sounds really interesting and exciting. And what kind of applications do you see where, where this thing could, could be used? Um, so I know of, um, of this project Moses in Germany, where they try to um, yeah, capture extreme weather events um, and, and measure them. So do you see uh, the application rather than in, in, in this frame or um, yeah, more in, yeah, I don't know, what, what, what do you see there? Yeah, 
Um, ultimately, you know, the word extreme is, is relative, right? It's, uh, it's what, what people perceive as extreme. And there will be different impact sectors that will perceive extreme in very different ways. So in fact, um, the classic one, of course, would be now to point to the floodings uh, that happened in the Ahrtal, uh, you know, in, in Germany. But um, and and perhaps be better prepared for that, and and give access to such simulations on demand um, to a, you know different levels of, of users. But um, there are you know I think there are many aspects where we can actually provide uh, extremes that we don't even know about. So um, the user could come in principle with say a definition what he thinks is extreme, and we could run this alongside. You know, he could provide us with this code. We would make a dynamic interface with such code and would run it alongside our digital twin. It would produce basically again a time series of his particular data, and he would be able to spot extremes and monitor whether certain levels or thresholds, for example, would have been reached. And that could be, you know, certain wind speeds in particular regions uh, that exceed, say, a threshold before you have to switch off the the, the turbine, or you know, I don't know. There there could be all sorts of applications. I would say. Other questions from the audience? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, I will, I will ask one myself. Um, obviously, the, the, the project is an enormous investment in uh, resources and enormous amount of work over a long period of time. I believe the, the timeline to the full scale uh, digital twin of Earth that I saw was something like 2027. Um, what's the what's the longer term plan for <laughs> maintaining uh, 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 this this work once it gets to the end of the current funding phase? And how how do you how do you protect a resource like this going forward so that it remains usable and uh, kind of you you get the return on that initial investment to build the thing? I think the generally the um, the setup is such that basically three European international organizations um, own basically some of the background that they bring into this project, and they they are already heavily, if like, invested in uh, these different directions. And and it would certainly be anticipated that these uh, implementing entities would also continue to maintain and 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 further improve these um elements of this investment and of course each of these institutions is governed by many different member states uh, in fact beyond the european commission um you know um, ecmwf has member states that are not only um you know european member states but also other member states and and i think so it, it actually i would say contributes even more to a you know vision of of um a global working together and and um, and solving basically a problem which is global. But financing clearly at the moment is only for those, uh, well, initially actually only for phase one, so two and a half years. Um, and then, uh, but with options, of course, then to extend this program and hopefully it will. Um, and, and then uh, clearly at the end of this phase, we, we are in a position of having a system that's very much in an operational setting. So um, investments in future phases will also be investments in maintenance infrastructure, maintenance, you know, people and, and user support and things. And we know this reasonably well because um, ECMWF runs on behalf of the European Commission, the Copernicus services for uh, the climate. Um, uh, so we have this, this CAM service for the um, atmospheric monitoring and uh, we have also C3S, um, which is for uh, climate monitoring. And, um, and so um, I think there is a good precedent, if you like, how such um, uh, maintenance can be handled in the longer term future um, to the benefit of the European, but also worldwide society. Thank you. Um, related follow-up question, um, is, is there any plan uh, or timeline for op um, open sourcing the code base, uh, at least to some extent. Is there um, any any discussion about that at this point, or is it a let's let's wait and see where we get to kind of kind of thing? Um, I don't think there is yet uh, a discussion like that. 
um, I mean, there, there is a little bit of discussion like that. I mean, ECMWF is moving very much, for example, to open data, open data policy. So in terms of the data, um, I think it's very much an open data policy. Um, with respect to the source codes and the developments, I think most developments that are going to happen within Destination Earth are um, likely to be open. I mean, like, you know, really open. So um, the, the, for example, this uh, library I mentioned for geoscientific modeling that we are also basing our future dynamical core developments on and things like that. This is already all under Apache 2, basically, so it's available. Uh, and all the tools, for example, with respect to I/O handling, and and uh, these are also all, all under Apache 2, at least for ECMWF. Now I, I can't speak for the other implementing entities right now, like ESA and OIMETSAT, because um, they will actually uh, contract uh, out many of the uh, tasks. So therefore, there will be an ITT which people can respond to, um, and and like implement it on behalf of these institutions. So. Um, the what the uh, say open policy there is I don't really know but I would hope that it would also be built on open cloud environments like OpenStack and so on on which others can build then and and actually extend the service so I would uh, I would expect that basically also in that arena um, it would be built on uh, you know open source uh, platforms that are can be readily extended you know beyond those implementing entities. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions from the audience? Please raise your hand. Uh, Adam Mertel has a question. Go ahead, Adam. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just very nice talk. Um, I would um, be curious uh, what kind of, if we are speaking about the open source, uh, what kind of open source uh, data set can we look forward to? If there is something, something interesting from your side that can to remind you mean I, um, I mean for example for the what i mentioned for the machine learning we would certainly make available a lot of these um, you know benchmarking sets perhaps that um, that would allow basically different people to uh, train their own applications in vectors where you know they could feed in as an input data uh, mythological variables that we produce um the, with respect to the actual raw data access, of course, will, will depend on the success of um, um, the entire infrastructure of being able to deliver some of this data, because I can tell you it's, um, you know, these fields are big and, um, and they are, you know, not necessarily, say, easily handled by somebody who doesn't understand them very well. So therefore, it's a, this is exactly what we want to solve, of course, um, in this process. So therefore, the data would come with a tool that would allow you to basically digest this data uh, readily in different uh, access mechanisms that that um, you know probably ultimately in some in some python that um, allows you to run basically uh, your own uh, software so um, this would be mythological data from our perspective of course you know various parameters uh, this would be um, also data that we could specifically design, say for hydrology applications, um, you know, specific data on, uh, on river runoff, specific data on, um, is that, is, I mean, does that answer your question? Is that what you mean? Or? Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. So environmental data and mythological data in, in the, you know, widest description. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Anybody from the audience? Raise your hand, please, if you have a, a last question for Niels. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, so I, I will ask it. Um, you mentioned er earlier, early on in your talk, um, uh, a little bit about the um, data harmonization strategy that Destination Earth will take uh, instead of the usual approach of interpolating everything to a common grid. Um, you mentioned the strategy would be to uh, bring the simulated data to the observation space. And I thought that was an interesting way of looking at it. I, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the details about how that works and what advantages it brings relative to the you know, standard inter interpolation approaches. Sure. Um, so, I mean, uh, 
bringing this to observation space and comparing an observation space is uh, standard practice what we do uh, and it's born by our experience in numerical weather prediction you know we, the the most accurate results um that we that we basically uh, achieve in uh, doing our data simulation procedures, assimilating, for example, radiances directly, and then um, translating the model information into radiances, um, and then comparing in, in radiance space. Um, otherwise, you would, you would have like second level products, um, for example, from satellites that would actually use uh, some archived uh, model data, which ultimately perhaps is actually ECMWF model data, but the lower resolution and, and sort of, you know, all sorts of other assumptions in higher level data would come in and would actually spoil, in a way, the, the raw information that we would be able to extract if we had compared it initially at the fullest uh, resolution possible. Or I'll give you another example. Um, if you would interpolate a lake data set uh, over Europe, um, to something like five kilometers, um, there wouldn't be any lakes or very few. Whereas if you look at the map at one kilometer below, uh, Europe looks like a lake, you know, it's water everywhere. And so uh, I, interpolation is actually a non-trivial activity. And I think uh, it depends on the application that people want to, want to um, ultimately achieve what kind of data access, you know, it defines basically the, the way you want to access the data. So I've given you two examples where we clearly interpolating it another way would have been absolutely no good. Similar for precipitation, for example. So basically the, the method comes with the data you want to look at. And, and, um, and so there will be users, don't get me wrong, there will be users that want to actually have a regular grid because they have their data on a regular grid and they're only interested in like every one degree have you give, you know, give me the temperature and every one degree. And for, you know, atmospheric temperature at 500 hectopascal, this would be great. Um, this is a fairly smooth field. There's no, you know, this, this is what ended for, for, for example, establishing global warming levels over a century. That's what you want to do. So there you want to minimize access time and minimize time of being able to overlay have different pieces of information, but that's a different use. And, um, and we will be able to provide that, of course, as well. And then you can compare it with, say, reanalysis data sets and all the other data that Copernicus and the Climate Data Store already provide. And, uh, and clearly, we can also provide data on that level. But I think the ambition for destination is, is, is higher, different, and, and really trying to provide the information at the more local level. And therefore, you, know, you don't want to... Um, yeah, def defuse it, if you like. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the great talk. And thanks again for joining us at our annual workshop. I'll turn it back over to Philip now. Okay, thank you for having me.